Okay, I guess we're mic'd up. So good afternoon. Uh, it's just about five minutes afternoon, so I think we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, welcome to, um, I see, what is the actual title of this? Something to the effect of this is going to be a pretty interesting session, possibly even the world's most interesting storage session. Um, so I'm Rob Esker. Uh, I spend my day at NetApp on all things product management and strategy around OpenStack and ecosystem. Been involved with OpenStack for five and a half years, pretty close to the inception within a couple months of it. Um, uh, we have today uh, on stage with us, uh, I guess maybe for the first time as one company, Mr. John Griffith. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself, but uh, I know he's a humble guy. I just want to point out John's kind of a big deal. He's the uh, uh, founder of the Cinder Project, uh, was the uh, uh, project technical lead for a long time, sat on the technical committee. But John, how about you introduce yourself? Right. My name is John. Nice to meet you. That's it. No. <laughs> See. Um, so yeah, my name is John. Uh, I've been uh, working on OpenStack for almost five years now, uh, not quite, about four and a half, um, as part of SolidFire. And as Rob mentioned, now we have SolidFire and NetApp merged together. Um, to bring something even better and, and make more change. So. so we're going to talk about a few different things. Um, I guess the basic sort of agenda is we're going to talk, just give you a preamble on OpenStack and NetApp, uh, you know, how we're engaged, uh, what we've accomplished, which hopefully sets the table for a discussion where we'll bring a couple of special guests on stage. Uh, they're over here, but I'll introduce them when, they, when it's time. And... Um, and thereafter, I think we'll kind of make it a little bit more of a conversational uh, discussion around a few uh, points, uh, um, uh, potentially, if you will, sort of opportunities for, for OpenStack to improve and some of what NetApp's thinking in terms of acting upon that. So I guess I just won't do that. Um, oh, I guess we're not actually getting uh, the progression on the screen. There we go. OK. Uh, I just want to point out, so from the beginning, um, uh, NAT's been involved. That's basically true of SolidFire as well. There was this small matter of SolidFire actually uh, uh, just became a company, uh, more or less concurrent with, with OpenStack, but uh, essentially born uh, concurrent, you know, while cl cloud was underway already. So sort of like grown, uh, came about uh, concurrent with the growth of OpenStack. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we are heavily invested uh, in the sense that we're deployers of OpenStack ourselves. We have uh, large-scale deployments uh, in both our engin global engineering cloud and then also in our corporate IT side of the house. I mentioned some of uh, uh, Mr. Griffith's accomplishments. We also have uh, Manila Project Technical Lead. Uh, we have elected board representation. Uh, and I think most significantly is uh, within the community, we've also... Um, been the single largest um, contributor, if you measure this over time, and this is via Stackalytics, to both uh, the Cinder and the Manila projects. And so you'll probably notice on the Manila side a large swath by Mirantis. That's actually commissioned by NetApp. So we, we basically engage them um, in, you know, in sort of an engineering outsource capacity to augment our capabilities. So the uh, point is two out of the three most significant or the two out of the three foundational storage services in OpenStack, NetApp's actually a leader for. Uh, and in the Swift sense, in the object storage sense, one of the reasons why we don't gauge quite as heavily there is we have our own object storage server called Storage Grid Scale. We'll touch upon briefly here in just a moment. So the, uh, we, we pretty closely watched the results of the OpenStack Foundation user survey, of course the most recent uh, version available as of, I think it was last week, possibly the week before. And uh, we've, uh, NetApp, uh, even before SolidFire, was you know, the most single widely deployed uh, backend amongst the commercial storage options for production. And this is specifically listing production deployment. And then, of course, that, that, that uh, um, position is significantly consolidated with the addition of SolidFire. I'll tell, like, very briefly a, a story. I'm not sure if everyone in the audience, uh, perhaps those who, who came from SolidFire, might not know. Uh, we, were, we were a little concerned about uh, the growth of SolidFire, so much so that uh, for a while NetApp was playing with um, building our own native all-flash array beyond our all-flash FAS kit systems called uh, FlashArray. And we uh, it had built a Cinder driver so that upon ship uh, we would have something that might seek to, to compete with SolidFire. 
Uh, of course, you know, that problem became solved for us uh, uh, when, when we actually acquired uh, uh, Solid Fire and that closed in February 2nd of this year. So. I do want to also briefly point out, and I do have the numbers obscured intentionally, uh, but I'll tell you that all of the columns are in the three-digit range. Um, uh, so the, the lower numbers are unique customers, and the, I'm sorry, the larger bars are unique systems. And so there's a few things that I, 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 we draw from this, and this is basically the last year's worth of, of deployment. This is telemetry we collect from the systems that are able to provide it with, with Cinder deployment. So there's a really significant growth. Even beyond the foundation user survey, we see a ton of growth uh, uh, and this is empirically derived. This is not just you know someone throwing a dart. This is these are, are systems that are being deployed uh, in production capacity and reporting back to us. Um, the, the, I guess one thing that's maybe a little more subtle that I do want to point out though is there's a pretty significant um, growth in the ratio of the customers to systems. I think I've mentioned this even in the past, perhaps in prior versions of, of this sort of session, uh, where we now are pretty convinced that this is going, this is, this is not merely production at an early state, but it's, you're starting to see X2 and X3 and X4, an organic growth, which is you know, definitely associated with we're no longer playing with it, we're actually making this work. Um, I, one of the things that uh, we want to point out, whether it's solid fire, whether it's uh, the historical enablements we've done with uh, uh, clustered on tap or E-series, some of the other NetApp platforms, we always do so upstream. And so regardless of which of the distributions that you seek to employ, um, uh, we're there. Uh, but likewise, we do go deeper uh, and uh, do uh, installer-specific integrations. And we'll just have, you know, there's a, there's a, a number of those listed here. Uh, and, and there's a different story behind each one of those logos. But just so you're aware, not only are we upstream, we also go an extra mile to try and improve upon just generally the user experience. Uh, that you that 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 uh, is so critical when you consider the complexity of deploying OpenStack. Otherwise, <coughs> so I'm not going to go into all the specifics. It's we don't have the time, um, but our effort is not just to the primary storage platforms: SolidFire, Data on Tap, E-Series. I mentioned Storage Grid. That's a alternative implementation of the Swift API. Swift. Uh, it, it is a Swift API endpoint itself. Um, AltaVault is a, a cloud uh, backup appliance that you know Cinder backup service can can land on. Uh, the point is, is we this is a whole effort. This is a portfolio enablement effort for NetApp, and and significantly we are now delivering a portfolio of capabilities. You might have thought of NetApp historically as a single platform company. That's signif That's definitely not the case. So Manila, I'm going to touch upon that very briefly. Uh, you'll see that listed. That's a, a project that NetApp pioneered that NetApp brought to the table. Uh, we built community around, and now you're starting to show up, see show up in, in the distributions. Uh, indeed, it, and the same user survey I referenced, it shows up as one of the most uh, significant areas of interest for new deployment. Um, towards that end, there's something been missing, though. Manila didn't have a project logo. Um, is this important? Uh, not sure, but uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, what's a, what is that thing? It's a jeepney. Uh, a jeepney, so at the end of World War II, the city of Manila, there was a, suddenly a ton of uh, U.S. surplus jeeps, uh, which were sold or, get, or essentially given to folks and essentially became like the de facto public transportation method for the city of Manila. They're like chromed and colored vividly. And frankly, it's much more attractive than that. So uh, the, that was voted upon by the community, by the way, that prior project logo. And if you want, you can have a Manila project sticker if you come up to us afterwards. So that's just a bit about NetApp. Uh, we have a ton of other sessions. I think it's 17. Uh, we have some material here that will direct you to those other sessions, not intending to go into a tremendous amount of depth about all of what NetApp's doing in all of the different places. That's covered well in those other sessions and generally at netapp.github.io. Um, we're going to transition to hearing a little bit from some of uh, our deployers and, and, for that matter, also partners in, in aspects. Uh, the first individual I'd like to actually bring to the stage uh, is Phil Williams, Principal Architect for All Things Storage with Roxace Private Cloud. Phil? Thank you, Rob. Hi, everybody. Uh, Rob asked me to come along today and just talk about, very much in general, some opinion on storage. Um, I've only got a few minutes, but I could probably go on for days. Uh, so without further ado, how do I see storage today in the OpenStack world? So my background is from enterprise storage. 
Um, I'm going through this sort of mindset change of, hey, there's a different way of doing things, but where are we? So the way I see the community is everything is about keeping things simple. Um, a lot of the successful deployments on OpenStack really are built for cloud native applications. We saw this morning that there's a huge majority and a huge, you know, significant amount of applications out there that just aren't cloud native. They're nowhere near being cloud native. It's going to take a long time for those guys to get to be able to consume OpenStack. So how can we adapt to what we have right now? Um, those guys, those applications, they look for high availability within the infrastructure, not necessarily in the application. You know, it's the whole pets versus cattle debate. And how do we petify uh, OpenStack a little bit, just almost like a, an interim. Um, we want those guys to get that to that sort of infrastructure, or you know, to work with that infrastructure over time. But how, how can we help them? How and you know, how can we move them to OpenStack and make Open, OpenStack successful within the enterprise? Um, just one thought around infrastructure and um, building availability or high availability into that infrastructure, which is something that's not all that common at the moment. Um, data is the most important thing in any business. No data, no business. Um, it's trying to protect it at an application layer compared to doing it in the storage layer. It's difficult, it's slow, it's expensive. It takes time to move things around. And especially as when you start looking at um, you know, disparate sites where you're building in HA for, you know, for catastrophic events, shipping data between sites is horrible. Doing it at the application layer is even worse. So if you can do it at the storage layer and glue that into the rest of OpenStack, that seems like the right way to go. So thinking about that feature, um, in terms of things like uh, Cinder Project, how can we start building in the things that you know, enterprise customers are looking for in that infrastructure? You know, things like clustering. It's nice to have that sea of compute and sea of virtual machines that are loosely coupled, but there are still use cases where we are reliant on voting you know, vo uh, and quorum disks. So how can we get that deeply integrated into OpenStack? Some bits of it are there today, some bits are not, and there's some rough edges. It's kind of hard work. Um, replication between sites, I mean, that's a huge, huge thing in the storage world and it's kind of paid the bills for a few years. It's nice charging twice for storing data. But it's important and enterprise asks for that. So how can we get that deeply integrated? Um, that then rolls into things like RPOs and RTOs. So Swift eventual consistency just doesn't fly in the enterprise. People are getting the mindset change of that's kind of OK, we can work around it. But how do we do with it today and how do we get them actively deployed today? So Rackspace and NetApp, I mean, quite simply, OpenStack is quite difficult to consume. It is complicated. Um, you know, people like ourselves at Rackspace, a um, whole bunch of other ecosystem providers, they help people get on board with, uh, with OpenStack. Um, we try and help everybody on that path, like I'm talking about, there is today. And how do we get them to being that cloud-ready, native cloud consumer? Uh, and it, it's going to take some time. Um, Rackspace can do all these things along with, with our friends over at NetApp um, within a customer's premise, so within your own data center, within a Rackspace data center, <coughs> in a third party site. We have a, a thing called OpenStack Everywhere now. So we can partner with our partners, we can glue this all together and provide it as a service. But whilst providing that service, we're helping with that journey to being totally cloud ready. And a few of the lessons learned. Um, I've said rough edges already, and there definitely are a few out there. Um, one thing I can't stress enough is validate, validate, validate. Uh, the CI process for Cinder is, is fantastic, but it, it still doesn't capture everything. There's the odd gotcha out there that's like, wait a minute, how, how, did, this, how did this pass and we not realize it? So I, you know, if it's using us or doing it yourself, make sure everything gets validated and actually works. Um, and a couple of sort of final thoughts, which I'll leave quite open. The ongoing debate of fiber channel and iSCSI. I've come from the enterprise background. I've built some of the largest fiber channel networks in the world. Fiber channel is great. Don't get me wrong. So is Ethernet. And it's so much more flexible. And there's so less cabling. And it's reusable. And you can use it for different types of storage and not just block. So 
it's a touchy subject with the enterprise guys, but I think they're opening up to, oh, we can do things differently. We've always used five channel. Let's look at a different route. Um, and finally, to converge or not converge, um, I think eventually we will get there. But when you're operating at scale, it's about using the right tool for the job. You wouldn't try and cram everything into, I don't know, take a car for an example. You wouldn't try and use the same car for every kind of purpose. We kind of go and buy something that's kind of general purpose, but you never get the fastest, but the most spacious. They don't fit together. Same with storage uh, and the same with compute. Distributed storage is hard. It needs very specific um, capabilities of hardware. And you then try and throw a compute workload on that same hardware, you get contention. It's, we're not quite there yet. Eventually, we will converge. But I just want to throw that one out there. And just finally, a shameless plug. Uh, we have the Rackspace Cantina across the street. So if you want to talk more about storage, what Rackspace is doing with OpenStack, feel free to pop across the street. Um, and there is lunch provided for the first 200 people a day. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Uh, thank you, Phil. And um, I'm, hurt. I'm told that maybe there's even libations to be had at some later stage at the Cantina. Yeah, probably, yeah. yeah anyway. Um, so uh, briefly on the topic of fiber channel, um, uh, NetApp has enabled it uh, on ONTAP and E-Series. The primary reason why we did it are for um, uh, those who already had investment in it and want to bring it into the OpenStack fold. It's to be clear, we very much agree, the right place to start Greenfield is with uh, iSCSI or NFS. So the next, and I, we can certainly go into more depth in the in the, later on in the, in the, in the uh, discussion, unless, John, you wanted to speak to that. I'll, I'll let it go with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you might even be able to uh, discern what John's feelings are yeah. about Fiber Channel from that comment. So, so the next uh, guest is Chris Ferraro, Senior Cloud Engineer from FICO. Uh, thanks very much. All right, thank you, Rob. Uh, my name's Chris. Um, I'm on the uh, cloud engineering team at FICO, and uh, I'll go through a couple of things uh, about some things about FICO, uh, how we're using OpenStack, some some of our uh, decisions, um, and get into some storage uh, details. So uh, first of all, um, we'll get into who is FICO. Um, uh, I think a lot of you might know us by FICO score. Um, uh, FICO's been around for a long time, since the, since the 50s, doing a lot of uh, data analytics and um, a lot of financial-related uh, data-driven type products. Um, they get into some customer, customer data. Uh, one, one other product you might be aware of is uh, when your bank calls you and says, hey, can you validate these last five, five transactions? Um, it's probably a FICO product that you're talking to there. Um, and they, um, they make a lot of decisions. 98% uh, of like, credit-related decisions are made by FICO. Um, and uh, 2.5 billion credit cards are protected by our fraud systems. So uh, they've been around for a while, and, and we cover a lot of the financial market. Um, so FICO has, in the last couple of years, decided to make a move to the cloud. And that's based on some. Um, uh, decision. They're, they're historically uh, been an on-premise um, on-premise company. Uh, products have sat inside major financial institutions, uh, and the there was a, uh, a desire to move into different markets that weren't really um, accepting of these huge appliances sitting in, in inside their data centers. We're moving towards more of a SaaS type model, um, and packaging up some of our some of our applications into a, a platform that our customers can then log into, hosted by us, uh, and utilize our tools to, uh, to massage and get more information out of their data. Uh, so it's a move away from the traditional on-premise um, technology, and, uh, and it also moves towards a um, more, more simplified uh, environment for for our customers as well as FICO's operational support. Um, 
and lowers costs overall that we found but, and gets us into areas that we weren't um, able to get into easily uh, because the, you know, the, the scalability of, of uh, SaaS as opposed to uh, more specific hardware and appliance related things. Um, so the first application or first platform that we're uh, targeting for OpenStack in this new, new infrastructure environment is uh, the FICO Analytic Cloud. It's, um, it allows our customers to use our tools and uh, you know, we have a marketplace where tools are available. They can pick and choose which ones they want their data to, be, to, be, to interact with and they pipe their data in and get out you know, information uh, from that raw data. Uh, so we have chosen OpenStack as our, um, to, to run this, this environment. And uh, this is, we pretty much checked all the boxes for, you know, uh, why we selected it. Um, there was, uh, there is the scalability aspect. Um, there's, uh, we were leveraging a lot of existing skill sets. Engineering team was always looking for uh, ways to, knowing that as our design matured, it would be handed off towards the operations team. And we were very um, aware that the operations team, uh, we wanted to have them work in similar technologies that they were already supporting, if, if we could handle that. Um, the, uh, the, the automated uh, deployments for the environment, um, easy ability to scale, uh, predictable costs, and um, guaranteed interoperability were, were important factors in these decisions. Um, so now I'll go into some of how the how our design uh, looks currently. Uh, it's gone through many iterations over the last couple of years that we've been doing this. Um, this gets into a little more detail, but um, we have load balancers at the front for the OpenStack APIs. Uh, we're pretty much standardized on on Cisco UCS uh, hardware to run compute and storage. We are doing Philip brought up uh, converged infrastructures. Um, we are doing uh, hyper-converged for storage and compute um, in this design. And uh, we have C220s as the controller layer. Um, and to manage some of that, uh, the hyper-converged contention between storage and compute, we're relying on C groups um, you know, to set up boundaries for who can run where on the environment. Um, we also have uh, tiered storage with, which takes advantage of both uh, Ceph for, as a general purpose storage uh, solution. Um, and we found that Solid Fire fit our need for, um, w Ceph isn't an all-in-one, like doesn't, uh, doesn't handle all workloads equally. Um, and we found that Solid Fire uh, does a really good job of providing a, a bit more power between our, uh, behind our storage and providing low latency and, uh, and fantastic performance. So uh, SolidFire comes in here where we have uh, high performance needs and have particular SLAs to, to meet to provide you know, solid, solid performance and uh, a common expectation for our customers. Um, we went with Ceph because it's the open source, uh, open source, you know, SDS type technology, um, general purpose block storage. Uh, they do have their CephFS, which they've been improving upon uh, in the last releases, and um, uh, object storage, uh, which we haven't got into. That's, that's on the plan, but um, we're, we're, we're looking at Swift um, for future, future services. Uh, so the Ceph was chosen um, as it's, it can be optimized pretty nicely for small and large deployments. Um, our, our, uh, our model is more uh, smaller deployments that can be scaled when necessary. Uh, we're dropping in a particular environment into, a, say, a new geographical region and uh, might start out small, but we'll need to grow as you know, more customers come on, more demand is there. And Ceph allows us to do that. Um, <clears throat> there's already a tight integration with OpenStack. And, but um, that being said, uh, Ceph doesn't meet all, 
meet the demands of all our application requirements. So um, we were we started looking at Solidfire um, uh, about a year and a half, maybe a little longer ago, and uh, they. Um, it was very impressive technology, and they were able to uh, fill that need, that high performance need that that Ceph wasn't able to to provide for us. Um, the dedupe and compression uh, is very helpful, especially in a couple of our use cases. And replication uh, is also um, was something we were looking for for site to site replication um, and and things of that nature. So um, why did we choose, uh, what were some of the choices or some of the reasons we went with SolidFire? Um, a lot of the same reasons that we went with OpenStack. Um, the uh, deployment, um, deployment speed, uh, we can automate the deployments much like uh, our OpenStack environments. Um, integrations were, were really strong uh, with OpenStack as well as VMware. Um, we aren't just running OpenStack in our environments. Uh, in more legacy FICO environments, we still have VMware uh, and SolidFire and, and our NetApp um, storage works, integrates really well with, uh, with VMware. Um, the uh, VDI is a good example of uh, where, where SolidFire uh, works fantastically well. Um, the the dedupe in the VDI environment is is pretty strong, and uh, you can you can set uh, the simplicity of setting up the storage environment is I think there's like three or four things you have to enter and pick a pick an SLA or a performance metric and uh, you set three or four things and boom you're done. Uh, it's real real easy to deploy and uh, gets up. Um, really fast. Uh, it also has the scale out. So like I said, w if we start with a smaller deployment in a particular location, uh, we can scale out the OpenStack pieces as well as storage individually or tied together um, as we go. Uh, um, these are some of our use cases for, for uh, our storage and what we were looking for again. Um, these are specific uh, you know, FICO use cases. Uh, we have we have the VMware integration, we have OpenStack integration, we have uh, VDI is using it heavily. Um, the high performance computing, again, data analytics requires, some of the applications are requiring very fast storage, it handles it no problem. Uh, and the DR uh, replication, you know, between sites or between devices is, uh, is very straightforward and, and strong. So what, um, what are we working on? Uh, these are some things that we have planned. Um, what we're looking for, what we're looking forward to in the future coming out of OpenStack, coming out of other projects. Um, looking, uh, as I said before, we've, we've been interested in Swift as a service for our, uh, for our developers and um, we'll be looking at that very soon. Uh, uh, shared storage volumes in Cinder. Um, that's a, a database requirement in a lot of cases or a specific use case there um, that we're hoping for more support of in, in future Cinder uh, releases. Um, the tooling, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the operational aspects of uh, OpenStack are still getting sorted out. Um, more advanced tooling for, you know, to understand how your environment is, is running. Um, and uh, once it's deployed, you know how do you operationally keep it keep it up and running? Those are those are pieces that we've been working on, and uh, and looking forward to some of the advances that the OpenStack community is coming out with. And uh, this is all we're always thinking of how uh, self service, how how our services can be provided internally to our to our uh, developers and to whoever might be using the platform. Uh, how self service can can we get it? Uh, you know, shifts the shifts a lot of the burden um, and improves the time for deployments. Um, I think it was mentioned before. Uh, you know how someone puts in a request and it could take however long to get it. We want to 
you know, shift that more towards the end users so they can uh, deploy and know that it's going to be deployed in X number of minutes or seconds. Uh, so that's, that's always uh, part of our design is, is the self-service aspect. Uh, and that's it for me. Rob, thank you. Thank you. All right, so I, I think uh, I should probably do a little bit of a time check. Um, if you can go over to talk about it if we have time. P please, yeah. Mr. Griffith. Um, so it kind of dawned on me. Uh, some of you may know me, some of you may not. Um, some of you may have heard this before, but I thought I should give you a little more background um, on part of what these guys are all talking about, especially in the solid fire situation, right? Um, so, SolidFire came about um, out of Rackspace. Our founder was at Rackspace trying to solve block storage there um, and came up with the idea of SolidFire. So, we're a scale out clustered storage system. Start with four nodes, scale out horizontally, um, no downtime upgrades, all that good stuff, right? All these things that you think about when you think about cloudy and OpenStack and stuff like that. Um, some of the things that Chris was talking about in terms of performance and things like that. Um, what's actually interesting is we're not talking about just like super fast or, or being like the Uber uh, storage device that blows the doors off of everything. Um, we're fast and that's all good, but our key is actually quality of service. So we let you actually dial in the minimum and maximum IOPS that you want your storage to have. So what we're doing is, is we're taking a pool of performance across the entire cluster and we're allowing you to actually specify what that is going to be for each volume. And you can do that dynamically. So as your loads, your workloads change and your demand changes and stuff like that, you can actually modify that on the fly. So if you've heard of the noisy neighbor problem, and you probably have um, if you're doing cloud stuff, um, that's the whole point. It's, it's to solve the noisy neighbor problem. Um, the other thing is, is uh, you know, back to NetApp and SolidFire being together, um, it's kind of an interesting journey for me. Um, Rob and I have done a lot of talks over the years, um, and we've talked a lot about different technologies like fiber channel versus iSCSI, replication, uh, you know, all these different features. And we've usually disagreed. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm the uh, iSCSI, bare bones, keep it simple, um, you know, cloud storage. And Rob has the other perspective um, and what's most interesting and I think what's most valuable about NetApp and SolidFire coming together is now you have uh, both perspectives covered. Um, so you can actually get whichever one suits your needs best. We're going to have something in our portfolio now that is going to be a perfect fit for you. And, and I think that's what's most exciting and most interesting. So. Yeah, we, we have occasionally agreed on a few things. But we have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there, there are a few things I think uh, we would like to cover uh, that sort of address, you know, the future state of, of OpenStack. I guess it's a little bit of a discussion on the state of the art now and some of the gaps. And I definitely want to invite, um, you know, our guests to, to chime in on this as well. Um, that's, a, that's a huge topic. There's, there's no shortage of things to, talk, to, to, to sort of uh, um, get into, but let's... When I think we wanted to talk a little bit specifically, and I'm going to actually fast forward past some of this uh, just because we're, we're running out of time, uh, to talk a little bit about not just OpenStack, but also the containers ecosystem that seems to be exploding not just adjacent to it, but also in times on top of OpenStack as well. And there's a few, a few things that I think we're, we're pretty interested in um, trying to move uh, these collective communities. You know, we're heavily involved in OpenStack, we describe that. We're, you know, we're members of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. If you're not familiar with that, there, you know, Kubernetes was was provided by Google to it. So, you know, hopeful that, that will have a standardizing effect on some element of containers. But there's certainly other contenders out there. What we're hoping to do is provide capabilities that are common across them and economize uh, on some of the work that's been done in Cinder, and avoid perhaps like the reinvention of the wheel, if you will. Um, actually, I'm just going to kind of go back briefly. Uh, some, an example of uh, some of the work that we've done in er, early state, and John, I don't know if you want to kind of get into this because you, you, you were engaged in it directly, um, is the uh, NetApp Docker volume plugin that was announced last week. Um, yeah, so uh, for those that are using containers and want to go the, the 
uh, you know, use storage inside of containers. As of 1.10, or 1.09 actually, um, you have the ability now to do storage management and attachment and things like that. Um, so while we were at Solid Fire, I was doing a number of things there to get us a, a driver that works there. Um, and at the same time, NetApp um, has a whole team of folks that are actually doing some really cool things with giving a full, um, a, a plugin that has a full range of, of NetApp portfolio devices underneath it. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then also, um, you know, as kind of an advertisement for myself, um, I'm, I'm having a talk tomorrow on uh, using Cinder uh, as a back end for, for Docker as well. So, Which was sort of the point, and thanks for the yeah. segue, was, you know, Cinder exists, and right now you're seeing within these different communities folks contemplating what would it look like to provision block storage and, yeah. you know, maybe provide differentiated access to different things. It, you know, of course, you're familiar with Cinder. That exists. So how can we bring Cinder? And that's sort of what we're alluding to in the last place. Docker, if you're familiar with it, is dead simple to deploy. Cinder, maybe not quite there. At least, you know, it's a slightly Unless different you're losing, bar. If you're using SolidFire, it's pretty uh, Well, and I'm referring to the Cinder <laughs> service itself. Yeah, yeah. So why can't you do pip install Cinder? Right. You know, and, you know, no, no presence of a comp file, you know, via directed sort of command line UI. Um, you know, answer the provide the relevant parameters, and there you go. I mean, that that's sort of the bar that's set by Docker. So how can we make it synonymous with it? Those are some areas that I think uh, during, in particular, the Design Summit tracks this week, we're interested in trying to you know hopefully move community consensus towards. Uh, you know, Cinder can be used uh, independently, modularly. Now, it's not as simple as that today. Uh, there are those who have. Uh, there's some large, in fact, a large online auctions uh, house in particular kind of pioneered that. Same thing with Manila. So let's let's actually uh, use it beyond maybe where the rest of OpenStack itself would be deployed, perhaps for, for containers independently. Uh, Software-defined storage is a huge, huge topic, of course, generally. I, we heard, um, you know, our, the, our guests here talk a little bit about uh, they didn't, I don't know if you guys referred to it as software device storage, but you know, you've referred to certainly Ceph, and I guess that sort of uh, resembles most of the characteristics assigned to software defined storage. Um, you know, NetApp uh, amongst our, our, our uh, portfolios, Data on Tap, that's what's powered filers, the things you probably most classically associate with NetApp. That, that's available um, in a software defined as a virtual machine. Um, it becomes a question, though, of like, how can I actually build like an elastic service with a fleet of those things? You know, how do I manage the life cycle of them such that when a Cinder and a Manila like start to reach resource exhaustion, that you know I need more or X more of the of qu quantity of those of the quality that's you know is being requested, and so this kind of lends itself to this notion of a software-defined storage controller. Uh, it, it's really quite interesting. Uh, solid fire in some ways doesn't need this quite as quite as much as the rest in the sense that it has some autonomous sort of auto scaling capabilities are just inherent to the platform itself. But even then there's still a point where you hit like the maximum possible and you need to contemplate how do I get to X2 and X3 and X4. And so we're pretty interested and have been having active discussions within this community and others around the establishment of a software defined storage controller project. Uh, this week in particular, I think, will be pretty interesting in trying to reach some conclusions. Uh, most of those discussions are sort of informal within the, the Design Center track. Um, and uh, you, you may hear uh, some of the discussion around this, not just from NetApp, but for some of the folks we've been talking about, uh, talking about it with in the community. Um, you sort of alluded to the bimodal IT tension. Uh, apparently, I'm on the on the far you know enterprise end, and we're on the cloud end, which is the first time I've been accused of that. Um, <laughs> it, is, uh, uh, but the reality is there is a there's a tension. There I, is. Mean, I don't know if you can kind of. I know you've you've lived this the hard way in Cinder. Yeah. So I, I'm actually a little more on on an extreme, and that's that's why I would I made the comment I did earlier. I should stand all the way so, over here. Yeah. <laughs> so and it's not that Rob is over on that extreme either, um, but I am definitely pretty far on the other side. Um, I, I'm a big believer in um, everything should be automated, everything should be software defined, um, everything should be simple and resilient, um, and that that's really the, the crux of it. Um, things to to me, things like fiber channel. And um, you know monolithic APIs and things like that, um, add-on packages, add-on features, and stuff. That is kind of against sort of the philosophy that that I have, and that I think Solid Fire has, uh, and and that's where some of that comes from. But the reality is, um, there are two sides to it. 
there are both sides of both sets of customers, and there is demand on both sides of that fence in terms of what people want. So um, that's why I said I think it's so interesting that that NetApp and SolidFire would come together because you you have both extremes at this point, right? Um, so. Yeah, we, we've, we've, I don't know how many customer conversations, you know, deployer conversations I've had, maybe 300 plus over the last few years. I, I don't know, that's just a, I think that might be right, 350. So, uh, there, and this is certainly not my uh, term, uh, I'm not sure where it came from, um, but, you know, there's this notion that OpenStack is a snowflake. Every deployment is a snowflake. You know, it's all hexagonal and frozen water, but boy, they sure do look a lot different from one to the next. And I think the distributions are kind of solving for that to an extent, you know, making it somewhat more de deterministic and repeatable. Certainly the DEF core effort may actually may influence that over time. Uh, we'll see, I guess. But um, the problem there is that on one end, you've got folks who, who look at OpenStack as a way to, you know, maybe as a foil or an alternative to sort of like the, you know, incumbent uh, enterprise virtualization stack, if you will. Way to be political. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and that's being done successfully. And I think there probably are folks in the room who, who are, are represented amongst that. And on the other end, you have fully cloud natives, you know, scale forevermore, uh, you know, and, and yes, there's that spectrum. And so within our own effort, um, uh, we try to appeal to both ends of the spectrum and we kind of came to the point where it became apparent we needed a portfolio that appealed to all of those different ends of the of the spectrum. Apparently, I've been a little bit. We've been collectively a too, little too long-winded, so we've run over. There's a guy gesticulating madly in the back, telling me to wrap it up. So, sure. um, uh, <laughs> please do uh, catch us afterwards uh, if you want to know about any of our other sessions. Go in more depth. We've got some directions to that, and then we also handy dandy laptop decals for the Manila project. So, um, thanks very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone.